Welcome back, everyone. So we're going to start off by trying to tame the Blood Pledge. That Ulfric sounds just like you, says Abbas, young and rebellious. You smile bitterly. Let's hope he won't be too rebellious and he'll make peace with Northblaze. I have to defeat him in battle, or I could bring him gold. I don't think he'd want gold. I don't want to fight him, but... You realize that people like me and Ulfric can only be tamed with the language of steel, don't you? I have to defeat him in battle. Ragnar growls in agreement. Not necessarily. Everyone wants something, says Nan. This Ulfric sounds to me like someone looking for recognition. Huh. He is a young and strong leader of a proud people, and wants the world to see him as such. If you give him that, you will win him. The only thing I would give this Ulfric is the blade of my sword, Ragnar growls. He will hardly be bothered to listen to you. If you go to him, he would probably cut off your head right there and then. Oh, okay, I do like the idea of a gift. Bring a gift to Ulfric and try to persuade him to bow to North Blaze once more. What, what would you choose? Whoa. Bring him a thousand gold pieces or promise him a wealthy girl from your people as his wife. I'm gonna do this, but it does feel pretty bad. Not gonna lie. Make a move. Oh, they're way up here, through the mountains. Cool. It takes a few days for you to reach Blood Pledge. You go by Rock's Pass and you arrive at noon when the sun is high above you. The walls of the city are a dark brown color resembling dried blood. As you approach, you realize that your tired eyes have tricked you. The city's fortifications are nothing more than a stake wall and the peculiar colors due to the rough bark of the wood. You also notice that it many places behind the wall there are piles of stone blocks and there are workers and craftsmen walking around. Nan's horse catches up with yours. It seems like Ulfric is approaching a real fortress, is building a real fortress. You nod. As you approach the city, you see that many of the wooden spikes of the paling have human heads impaled on them. Ooh. You send riders to announce your arrival and the leader of the Blood Pledge welcomes you at the gates with a dozen of warriors. With a dozen of his warriors. Greet him. I greet you, Ulfric of Blood Pledge. I accepted your messengers, wayward of the nameless people. I was told you were coming to me with a request. What is it? Despite his strong accent, he speaks the sinful language confidently and carefully chooses his words. Test your skill in speech. I bring you a gift worthy of a great ruler. An honorable nobleman of the nameless people wishes to offer you his daughter's hand so that you can see that our feelings are sincere. Ulfric looks at the young Isandria you chose to give him as his wife. Clad in red fox fur, she's one of the most beautiful women you have ever seen. After long negotiations, her father Asadomir, rich fur merchant, reluctantly agreed to give his lovely daughter to the leader of Blood Pledge. Isandria takes a few steps forward. Ulfric looks bewitched by her beauty and cannot take his eyes off her. In your thoughts, you congratulate yourself for the successful move. Thank you for the gift, Wayward. Now tell me why you've come here. I'm ready to hear your request, Ulfric says at last. I have come to offer you an alliance with Northblaze once again. Lay down your weapon, and Lord Eren will be your friend once more. Why? Ulfric asks simply. You look confused. He explains, why should I ally myself with Northblaze? To go to war together against Merc. Or because honor demands it. I'm going to go with Merc. I have decided to wage war against Merc, whose troops are harassing your lands as well. I want North Blaze and Blood Pedge to be my allies in this war, and that is possible only if there's peace between you and Lord Eren. Ulfric studies you with newfound interest. You're brave, son of the Nameless, and I am fond of bravery. And it is indeed true that our lands have suffered much from Merc. If anyone leads an army against the City of the Seven Snakes, the people of Blood Pledge will support him. And if that one is you, even better. He ceases speaking, and silence is established. You are mentally congratulating yourself on the success when he speaks again. Let's say I make peace with North Blaze. Let's say I only agree to do it because of your promise of a march against Merc. What will my share be then? Will you give me an equal share of the loot, as much as everyone else? Will I have the same rights as everyone else in your military council? I'll agree. Lord Aaron may not be happy, but... He's not in charge here. You nod affirmatively. You are the one who will be leading the army against Merc, and you alone have the word on these matters. 
Lord Aaron has constructed you to convince Blood Pledge to go back to the Alliance with North Blaze, but he did not specify how that should be done. Ulfric looks happy. When you proffer a hand for the two of you to tie your deal as peers, a sincere white smile lights up his face. You just want a valuable ally. Now you hear the approving mumbling coming from the warriors behind you. Despite your young age, you have managed to take some difficult negotiations to a successful end. All right, two more glory points and three squads of blood pledge spearmen. Sweet. Speak softly. Chose diplomacy over brute force. All right, let's protect the caravan. What should we do before the caravan sets off to Discord? Abbas asks. Uh, we, why don't we set a, up a trap for them? I like that idea. We know which way the caravan will take, and we know they will attack us when we approach the steps. Abbas seems enthusiastic about the idea. We have plenty of time to prepare a trap that will make the raiders give up their wish to pillage once and for all, and we will not have to send for any reinforcements from Nameless Forest. The decision is yours. Set up a trap. It would have been nice to get reinforcements, though. I don't know that it's the best way to fight this battle, but man, I could definitely use some reinforcements. All right, we're gonna go down here. A few days later, you approach the steps. You stop at Wind's Crossing and set up a camp. Since you suspect that the Horse Lords have their scouts around the road to warn about approaching caravans, you wait until nightfall. Under the cover of darkness, you go ahead with Abbas to look around the area. Let's check out the ruins. Soon, you reach the abandoned ruins of a long-destroyed fortress near the road where the caravan will pass. The horse lords never attack too far from their native lands. The road down there veers far away from the steps. I think they will probably hide in the ruins as soon as they know the caravan is approaching. From here, they can descend on us, showering us with arrows. What do you suggest we do? Albus asks. Okay, um, they'll hide in the ruins. And they can come down and shower us arrows. Okay, so we can get off the road and give the ruins a wide berth. We can dig deep ditches in front of the ruins and cover them with branches and, and grass. And we can spread explosive powder around the ruins. Well, that seems pretty... We can just set up bombs. I want to dig deep dishes, though. We can put spearmen in there. Oh, but we'll have to get all the nameless troops to dig if we want the ditches to be ready before the caravan arrives. I don't like that, then. Okay, we can spread explosive powder around the ruins and set it on fire from a distance with flaming arrows. That way, none of them will be able to escape. They will all burn. But I will need your help to make enough explosive powder, Abba says. You look at him hesitantly, and he nods in assurance. It's a cruel fate for our enemies, but you must consider the lives we'll save on our side. And then we can get off the road and give the ruins a wide berth. All right, I want to do the fire trap. I don't really care that they're going to suffer a ton for it. You need large amounts of the awful substance. In addition, you need a few other important ingredients, Abbas explains to you. Salamander powder is required so you can prevent the fire from reaching you when it grows bigger. You also need to spread oily powder over the explosive mixture to stop the wind from blowing it away before the battle begins. In the next few days, Abbas and you carefully prepare all the substances. The job is arduous, but only the two of you have the necessary knowledge to do it. You share all the tasks and it is up to you to make half the explosive powder. Well, let's see if our science works here. When the substances are ready, you and Abbas once again use the cover of night to return to the ruins and spread the explosive powder in a wide circle. The tall grass here is dry enough to catch fire at the first blast, you think to yourself. You spread the rest of the prepared powders in the meticulously chosen places and return to your troops. The next morning, your scouts inform you that a large group of riders from the horse lords has neared the ruins. This happens just in time, since the caravan is already within a day's journey from you. You set off to rejoin the caravan. One day later, you reach the ruins again. You signal your archers to ready their flaming arrows. Heavy silence falls upon you. Time drags heavily on, and the wind, which has been blowing with a prolonged howl, has now subsided. Suddenly, war cries ring out, and the first attackers show up from the ruins. You give your men an order to shoot. The burning arrows whistle through the air and fall where you spread the explosive powder. A flame blazes and the horses of the attackers get up on their hind legs, blinded by the sudden bursts of fire. The flames quickly consume the dry grass and soon your enemies find themselves surrounded by a fiery wall. Your archers draw their bows again. The neighing of the horses merges with the screams of the wounded and the air grows heavy with the sharp smell of charred flesh. A few hours later, 
When the fire subsides and ashes and dust fill the air, the nameless warriors bring you several enemy soldiers burned but still alive. You instruct the horsemen to return to their people and relay the story of what happened. You tell them to let everyone know that this fate awaits anyone who dares to attack North Blaze's caverns again, caravans again, or stand against you, wayward of the nameless people. You see the fear in their eyes as they silently nod and bow low to the ground. When they are gone, Abbas tells you, the horse lords will certainly not attack North Blaze's caravans anymore. They are too afraid of fire, which can outrun even their fastest horses. And if one day you send them an offer to march with you against Merc, the likelihood of them joining you will not be small. You look at him surprised, but I just burned their warriors alive. And you showed that you could gain victory by drawing streams of blood. Be sure that many nations will tremble in fear when they hear what you have done, and many of them will be more inclined to join you than to stand in your way. Abbas's words echo in your ears. They will be more inclined to join you than to stand in your way. What ruler would not want to hear that? And indeed, when a few months later your envoys make a proposal for the alliance with the horse lords, you gain the consent of their leaders. Whoa, surprising. So we got a glory point and three squads of step riders. Great. Ashes to ashes. Defeat the step riders without entering battle. Um, well, I don't know what to do at Silver Slope still. And I still have no way to get a fleet. So let's go back to North Blaze and tell them what we did. Make a move. The Steel Palace. You return victorious to North Blaze, the Steel City, where Lord Aaron welcomes you to his palace. You see a smile sneaking onto his face when you tell him that you've successfully completed the mission. To be honest, he begins, I didn't believe you could handle the two missions, but you have proved me wrong. The view, two of you talk long and in detail, while the servants bring you meals and drinks, which help you wash away the weariness from the long travel. Finally, as the time comes for you to be on your way, Lord Aaron says, Wayward, if you lead the peoples of the North to war against Merc, the Knights of North Blaze will support you. As you are leaving this palace, you still cannot believe it. You are on your way to wage a war against Merc, and your allies are the mighty Knights of North Blaze. Alright, three squads of Knights. Great. I think you'll do well to dismiss the warriors and give them a break for a few days, Ragnar casually says when you two approach the city gates. Abbas quickly joins him. I agree, but don't make them stay in this gray and boring place. Let's go to Hellfury. It's not too far from here, and it offers much more fun for all of us. Ragnar mutters something to himself, but apparently even he can't deny that North Place is not a city for entertainment. Non adds, You really have to give the soldiers a break, but I don't know if they'll enjoy the entertainment of Hellfury. Perhaps it's better to let them return to the Nameless Forest and see their families again, even if it's a short time. Huh. Wherever the soldiers go, we could pay a visit to our friend Olan and stay a couple of days at his lovely inn, you suggest. Ragnar and Non seem to like that idea. I'd prefer for them to go back to their families, to be honest. Yeah, Hellfairy is a city where streets swarm with drunkards, broads, beggars, idlers, thieves, and murderers. Your warriors, who have spent their entire lives in the quiet and secluded, nameless forest, would hardly feel comfortable in such a place. You believe they will enjoy themselves much more if they are with their families. You turn out to be right. The warriors are enthusiastic about your decision, pleased that they will see their relatives. Great. The four of you on the other side can choose where to go. Um, Olan's Inn was my suggestion, so I'll follow my suggestion. Accompanied by Ragnar, Nan, and the frowning Abbas, who was angry because he could not stop at his favorite pub in Hellfury, you head for Olan's Inn, where the four of you are planning to rest for a few days. Olan, an old acquaintance of yours from the years when you were traveling the Sinlands with the caravans, welcomes you with a wide smile and a strong breath of beer. Friends, you come right on time. Just two days ago, we received a few barrels of the best beer you can taste in the West Rim. Abba seems to come back to life, and his bad mood is gone without a trace. Then what are you waiting for? Let us make sure it really is the best and not another one of your lies. Science works with evidence, and I am ready to sacrifice myself for its progress. You spend the next few hours lost in tales and memories of past times. The beer turns out to indeed be one of the best you have ever tasted. You feel the fatigue and pressures of over come challenges slowly leaving your body oh great we got a life point back we're still terribly low Abbas raises his mug so often that he finally falls asleep at the table Ragnar and Nan go to their rooms tired from the travel and the frothy li liquid only you Olan and a few other guests stay in the main room of the inn engrossed in conversations it is already night outside and rain is pouring down when the door suddenly opens 
a group of nameless foxes burst inside the inn. The red fur they wear on their backs is wet from the rain. Their faces are grim, and they are holding their weapons at the ready. Surprised to see them, you jump to your feet, but freeze when you notice that one of them is a carrion himself. Ah, oh, this guy. We knew he was going to cause trouble. Well, don't tell me you're surprised to see me, wayward, he says. Who is this? Asks one of the guests of the inn, slurring his words, his tongue heavy from the beer. A carrion looses an arrow so fast that your eyes, already slow from the alcohol, fail to track his movements. The curious guest drops dead from his chair, struck in the throat. Um, that seems harsh. That's not necessary. A carrion laughs, despite the fact that he has just killed a man. You really aren't a bright one, are you? What do you want? You, of course. You deceived the nameless people by promising them the impossible. If it weren't for your lies, our people wouldn't be on their way to a doomed war with Merc now. He knocks a new arrow. His eyes are filled with hatred. He must have waited for you to separate from your warriors to catch you. He probably has someone loyal to him in your party, so he knew where to find you. Now you will get what you deserve, cheat. Convince Akarian's men to stand on your side. Say to Akarian that the nameless people should decide your fate. He's not going to go for this, so I'm going to try to convince his men. Warriors of the nameless people, you shout to the foxes accompanying Akarian and they tremble. Listen to me, you continue. Do not violate the traditions and slaws of our people. That, which is most sacred to you, rests in your hands today. Do not toss it in the mud. Test your skill in speech. You try to convince the nameless warriors to leave Akarian and support you. However, before you can finish your speech, he hisses, Enough! and releases the string of his bow, striking you in the shoulder. Fortunately, your armor takes some of the strength off his shot. You manage to stay on your feet. Maybe it is time you tried to save your life in another way. Shit. Wait, you raise your hand. What? Akarian loosens his bow. Isn't it fair for the nameless people to decide if I'm really guilty? Chain me up and take me back to our forest. Let the people decide whether I'm to be blamed for something. You see hesitation in his eyes. You are almost certain he wants to remove you, to take the lead of the nameless people. But now he's probably thinking that if he can set your people against you, in order for everyone to confirm your sentence, his usurpation will be more well received. Reluctantly, he orders to have you chained. You set off to the nameless forest in the rain and the darkness. Test our glory, oh dear. Somewhere between the woods of Oakleaf and the steppes, your group is ambushed. In the splashing rain, you recognize the gray furs of the nameless wolves. You see the nameless bears swinging their hammers with mighty roars, and the antlers wearing nameless deer who pierce your guards with their long spears. In just a few minutes, the carrion and his warriors are crashed. It turns out that your loyal warriors from the nameless forest accidentally learned about a carrion's plans to kill you. They then quickly gathered a squad of warriors to find and protect you. Oh, but we lost a nameless fox squad. They bring you to the wounded, but still living a carrion. He looks at you with hatred, and the warriors gathered around you await your decision. You feel the rage they have accumulated against the traitor who tried to kill you. Many insist that he pay with his head. I can't trust this guy. He can't come against me like this. You know that one day, when the great judgment comes and there's nothing left of your body but dust, the tears of the wounded and the slain will weigh against your soul. But you also know that your soldiers expect you to be just, even if that means being cruel. You have to be the ruler whom they want to follow. Without saying a word, you kick the kneeling Akarian and he falls to the ground. You take the axe of the soldier next to you and, under the approving looks of the warriors gathered around you, you cut off the traitor's head with a single stroke. The rain quickly washes away the splashes of blood from your boots. Gain a glory point. If there can be only one, deal with a challenge to your leadership. We are dangerously weak though. There's a new place up here called Iserum. Uh, there's nothing I know how to do at Silver Slope. We could go to Fleet, but I, again, I don't... F well, we could just check in. I don't think we have any ways to get help for a fleet still. Non told you once, if you want to defeat Merc, sooner or later you'll have to lay siege to the mighty city. Yeah, we read this. Yeah, there's no option yet. All right. Iserim is our only real good move here. A few more months pass, and during that time you visit your allies again to discuss the war plans in detail, and decide what will be the best time to hit Merc. There are still a few tribes and peoples whose support you might need, and are worth winning over. To every one of their rulers you send one of your mentors, accompanied by the same warriors that you have been through so many adventures with. 
Meanwhile, you gather a new group of nameless soldiers to escort you to the northern mountains. There lived tribes of barbarians that Merc subjected to its power a few years ago. You hear that even their leaders are forced to pay the dark tribute. This is why you hope that they will rise up in a rebellion to reject the seven High Lords. You pass through Isarim and head for the slopes of the northern mountains. In the last few days, you have had trouble sleeping, constantly tormented by thoughts and doubts. When you set up camp at the foot of the mountains, you sit beside the fire and wrap your thick cloak around you. Your eyelids are heavy, and you feel that sleep is trying to take you over you once more. And again, just when you are ready to surrender to its embrace, dark, angry voices rise up in your head, asking questions and expecting answers. Is what you intend to do really the right thing? Yeah, it definitely is. Do you really want to drown half of the Sinlands in blood to quench your own thirst for revenge? Would your father approve of this? I'm not the only one who wants revenge, you whisper with your eyes closed, and your breath comes out in puffs of condensation. The air is cold and nipping, and the northern mountains loom over your camp like dark giants ready to throw themselves on you. The Sinlands weep under the tyranny of the Seven. Someone has to fight them. I'm not doing it just for my father's sake. I'm doing it for all the fathers that were killed before their children's eyes. Is that so? The voices ask. Are you not fooling yourself? You are just a boy. You are no king, and you will never be. Who gives you the right to decide the fate of so many people? In life a king, in death a failure. You startle and look around. One of the nameless warriors is singing quietly, gazing at the starry sky. He stops and turns to you when he senses you are watching him. What's that? You ask him. What are you singing? He looks confused. Don't you know it? The song of the Dusty King? The Dusty King, yes. The memory of the old legend emerges and solidifies in your mind. The king who wanted to change the world. He craved the change so much that he took the dusty road, leading to the center of the world in the spring of evil, determined to destroy the source of all suffering. How did the song go? I've walked this road and fed its hunger. I wore it down, and it wore me down. The voice of the nameless warrior floats quietly in the cold air. Because of the long years the king spent walking tirelessly on the dusty road, he was remembered in the legends as the Dusty King. You struggle to remember the rest of the words to the song. As sleep tries to take over you again, it becomes harder and harder for you to think clearly. Did the king reach the source? Did he succeed in changing the world? You startle and look around. Somehow, you find yourself before the walls of murk, which are wrapped in fog. The tall stone walls are half destroyed, with gaping holes from the catapults. The city gates are closed, and the fortress arrow slits look empty and abandoned. You look at your right hand. You are holding your father's axe. That is enough for you. Murk and your father's axe. Those are the only things that matter now. You hear laughter and look around. Where is it coming from? Who's there? Who's laughing? Because of the fog, you can see nothing but vague shadows running around you. The laughter does not stop, but more voices join in, giggling, throwing mocking words and ridicules. They're all directed at you. Who's there? You roar again, and turn around, ready to slay with your axe anyone who stands in your way. You look up and freeze. You see faces, huge human faces, watching you from the fortress walls, from the arrow slits, and from the gates of murk. Cruel, twisted, sneering faces in the stone walls. Without ever having seen them before, you know these are the seven high lords of murk. So what now? They ask, and their voices make the gates and walls tremble. What are you going to do now that you are here? Are you going to kill us? And then what? You rush forward, ready to slice the faces to pieces. You reach the gate, but the fog swallows you completely, and you cannot see anything anymore. You swing your weapon furiously, and you wake up. The campfire is almost out. The nameless soldiers are sleeping around you, wrapped in thick furs. You hear two of the soldiers that stand guard talking quietly. For some reason, at this moment, you recall how the legend ends. When the Dusty King finally reached the center of the world in the Spring of Evil, he just realized that if he destroyed the source, he would irrevocably destroy good, as it too sprang from the same place. He fell into disrepair and did not know what to do. Salt, you mutter to yourself. For so long did the Dusty King wonder how to vanquish evil without destroying good, that in the end he petrified into a pillar of salt, towering over the spring of end of everything. In life a king, in death a failure, 
you hear a cry of pain. One of your nameless soldiers lets out a scream just before his words are lost in a death moan. Your camp is under attack. Uh oh. Ambush, really? Man. The surprise attack catches your warriors unprepared. Some of your men are killed in their sleep, others defend themselves furiously. But soon you realize that this battle is lost. The battlefield is covered with the bodies of more nameless soldiers than enemies. You notice that some of your assailants carry the symbols of the Seven. Your attackers are sent by Merc. You plunge even more fiercely into the battle. However, while charging, you stumble on a dead body. You fall, and as you struggle to stand up, somebody strikes your head with all their force. You feel a sharp pain cut through your head, and your limbs go numb. Another body falls on top of you, and you cannot move. You try to shout, but you are paralyzed. The pain gradually fades and gives way to the darkness. You lose one life point. This is pretty bleak, guys. We're down to one life left. And we've been captured. You regain consciousness in a cart, slowly moving down a road. Your head feels muddy from the heavy blow. Run a hand over your face. You feel your face is stiff and run your hand over it. It is completely covered with blood from your wound. Um, let's look around. Despite the pain, you look around. Fog spreads everywhere around you, and the cart you are in is carrying a pile of lifeless corpses. You feel sick when you realize you are lying on your warrior's cold bodies. Get up on your elbows. Get up on your elbows and look around again, but in the fog you can hardly distinguish any details. Maybe you are not far from where your campfire was. You notice the silhouettes of the soldiers, and hear the clatter of hoofs and the creaking of wheels of other carts. You realize that they must have seen you lying motionless with a bloody head and thought you were dead. A horseman approaches and you lie down on your back. Relax and close your eyes. You hear the rider call the carter. Did you understand? You ride straight to Merc. The High Lords want to see them with their own eyes. The carter responds grumpily. Yeah, I got it. You don't need to say it a thousand times. I'll bring them the corpses, don't worry. And when should I come back for the wounded? The wounded will ship, shouts the rider as he rides away. We would need more carts for 50 captives and the High Lords want to talk to them about their leader as soon as possible. To the devil with Merc and its seven High Lords, how could they have caught you so unprepared? You look at the carter cautiously, and your heart starts pounding faster when you see your axe lying beside him. He must have liked it and decided to take it for himself. That stealing cur! You have to get out of here, but how? Jump from the cart and disappear into the fog, or wait until the cart gets further away from the battlefield. Man, if we mess this up, we're probably going to die. Um, fog seems really helpful for escape. And they're not expecting me to be alive or even move, so let's do it. I have no time to lose. You think to yourself, if the soldiers really were holding 50 of your warriors in captivity, you would not want to think what awaits them. The dungeons of Merc would be the best they could hope for. You crawl to the carter, grab your axe lying beside him, and jump from the cart. You hear his surprised scream behind you when he sees that one of the dead bodies has come to life, grabbed the axe, and escaped into the fog. You run at full speed without knowing where you are going. The fog is so thick that it is hard to watch your step. You glimpse shadows around you and you think that you hear shouts and hurrying footsteps. Then you trip over something and fall down. Let's see what it was. Oh no, trying to see what it was, your eyes meet the face of one of your nameless soldiers whose dead body is pierced by several arrows. At that moment, you hear someone running toward you, and you rush forward again. You trip over one more time. Your pursuer is catching up with you, and even though you quickly get on your feet again, you feel they are very close now. You are already ready, to, almost ready to turn around and meet them, axe in hand, when a soldier holding a loaded crossbow suddenly appears from within the fog in front of you. Apparently... He must have heard you approaching because he is pointing his weapon in your general direction. You see how he prepares to shoot when you also appear out of the fog in front of him. Um, we could pounce on him, but he'll probably shoot. I'm going to jump aside. You lunge to the side, and the arrow whizzes past you. After the lunge, you end up right at the edge of a small valley. Oh man, this is bad. Your feet slip on the damp grass. You wave your arms, trying to keep your balance. You fall, and after a short tumble through undergrowth, stones, and roots, you reach the bottom of the valley, bruising your ribs. You lose one life point. 
We are dead. Wow. An unfortunate end of your adventure. Man, we failed. All right, so it looks like we could restart after the last checkpoint. Um, I wonder how much farther that takes us back. What an interesting game. Uh, I'd be curious to hear what all you all think. The story's cool. Um, I kind of wish there was more to the to the gameplay or to the combat of the game. I mean, it, it does feel like a lot of the choices we're making in the story matter, but um, I mean, I guess you know this is a super indie game, so it's probably really efficient to be able to do the game this way. But yeah, sorry I died, guys. Um, yeah, let me know what you think. Yeah, it's uh, it's tricky to think if even going back to the last checkpoint will help us that much because we only had one or two health. But anyway, thank you everyone for watching. Um, yeah, let me know what you think of the game and I'll talk to you next time.